When do we go live, Simone? Will you let me know? Are we live? No. We're live? We're live. Okay, this is great. Coming to you live, it's Tuesday. Good morning from uh, EPSC 2022. It's a second session of daily briefings. The room is packed, absolutely packed to capacity this morning. Everybody got up super early to join me, but thank you for joining us online and thank you all of us this morning uh, for joining us too. So day two, we have 30 minutes uh, to cover a lot. We're mainly gonna be focusing on three things. Uh, we have Lena here this morning, uh, back again. Good morning, Lena. How are you? Good morning. Did it's you have nice a good to day be back here. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? Did you have a good day yesterday? Yeah, it was an amazing first day to start yeah. with. Yeah, it was really good, full on. And then beside you, we have Gareth Davies. Good morning, Gareth. And you're good going to morning. talk to us about the European Transnational Access, of which you are responsible for. I will. And uh, we're particularly going to stress that today is the opening of the next call, so oh, people yeah. can apply to use the facilities. OK, brilliant. And then joining you then also we have Kei Lee, who's mm -hmm. come from Korea, yep. and you're also going to talk about transnational access coming from Korea. Right. OK, how are you this morning? Uh, good. <laughs> Did you have a good day yesterday? <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, it was uh, my first time in the EPSC, but it was great meeting and then oh. I really enjoy it. Yeah. yeah, it's lovely yeah. putting a face to a name, isn't it? And, and having those conversations that we just can't have online. So mm -hmm. it's lovely to be back in person. Yeah. And then beside you, then we just pulled Hi. you in at the last minute. Good morning, <laughs> Fernando morning, Gomez from Argentina. And you're going to also be talking about transnational access with the field sites, Yeah, right? basically, but the okay. field sites where Brilliant. our own people to visit. Lovely, yeah. yeah. And then lastly, then we'll have a quick chat with our keynote coming straight up after here, which is uh, which is uh, Toro uh, Yada from, from JAXA. So let's start with you, Lena. Here's the Here's the clicker. You know how this goes now. Uh, tell us about what IANA is and some of the its connections to EPSC this year. Yeah, thank you that I have a little bit more time today to introduce IANA. I um, mean, yesterday I already mentioned that IANA is co-organizing the EPSC this year. So IANA is short for European Astrobiology Network Association that actually exists since a little bit more than 20 years. So last year we had our big 20th anniversary online. Sadly, we had big plans to do it actually in person in Porto, but still um, it's really an, an amazing family of scientists that has been developing over the last 20 years and I'm really proud to be part of the family. And uh, yeah, Barbara Cavalazzi, um, she is our outgoing president uh, in a row of really amazing presidents that we had, uh, André Brack, uh, Gerda Hornig, Francis Vestal. Uh, yeah, Barbara, and uh, actually on Saturday we had some new elections with uh, Jean-Pierre de Vera being our new president, and um, I'm honored together with uh, Rosa de la Torre to be now vice president of the IANA network. Wow, you're a busy lady. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, what are the highlights for this year with uh, IANA's activities at EPSC? Yes, yeah, so this year actually IANA does not have the typical annual scientific meeting, but instead at EPSC, we have been organizing a lot of different astrobiology sessions. And actually, if you go through the program of EPSC, in total, we have 12 or 13 actually astrobiology relevant sessions, splinter meetings uh, spread all over the week. And of course, we are very proud to have uh, Barbara as keynote speaker then on Thursday presenting again what is the, actually the science that you're doing in IANA, what has been happening in the 20th anniversary year of IANA. That's great. And so what's your day going to be like today? What else have you got going on today? Actually, today I'm having my own scientific session and I'm, I'm sharing a session today. Well, and enjoy that. And you're User wearing experience. a badge. What does your badge ask me about EPSC? Tell us what that is in case people see you today. What do you want them to do? Well, ask me about anything that you want to know about EPSC <laughs> or about EPEC, EPEC or about AppGrade E, our two great uh, early career networks that we have at okay. um, EPSC or Europlanet and uh, IANA. Okay. Or ask me anything you want, actually. Actually, just ask Lena anything. That's what she's saying. She'll do it. Okay, thank you very much, Lena. I, you can pass the mic on to Gareth, and um, you can stay here if you like. But if you if you want to step down, you're 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 more than welcome. But you stay here if you want. It's fine. Gareth, now we have this is the main focus of this morning. We really want to talk about transnational access, and as you say, today is this is the start of the call for the third session of that. So you oversee basically. You're in charge overall of the of the transnational access for for Europlanet. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? You're from Fry University. In, in Amsterdam based there. So tell us a little bit about that and then what you'd like to share okay. with us this morning. Yeah. Well, 
I think I'll give first of all the background about what we actually offer, yeah, what please. the facilities are. Uh, we, we split the, the facilities into two. We have uh, a series of field sites where people can go and actually do field work or collect geological samples or astrobiology samples. And uh, the team on my left will talk a little bit more about that later. So I won't uh, steal their thunder by talking about that too much. And then we have uh, 24 laboratory facilities, and it's, it's really more than that. Many of the laboratories have multiple facilities involved where they, you can do simulations of uh, planetary conditions, look at different atmospheres, different pressures, look at different radiations, or you and then a second suite, which is more analytical, where you can actually analyze the compositions of minerals or the chemical compositions of things. And of the, so we have 24 sites scattered all around uh, Europe. But one of the things we've really focused on over the last five, six years is expanding internationally, which is why Keywork is on my left. So we now have agreements with people in Korea and uh, uh, where else? We? And we have also facilities in other, other, other parts of the world, including China, for example, where people can apply to visit. And the only, the only, there is no real drawback because the thing I really need to stress is that access is free. Uh, Europlanet will fund your travel, your accommodation. The laboratory have their costs paid. So for people who apply, there's actually no, you just need to be able to get there. That's and fantastic. even these days, you don't even need to be able to get there. As we'll explain, in some cases, it's possible to do virtual visits. Clearly during COVID, we we're under lots of pressure to actually try and hold visits, but not actually move people there. So we've done a lot of experimentation on how best to organize virtual visits where you're using Zoom or some similar thing and uh, you're communicating with the laboratories. That's just fantastic. What a fantastic opportunity for people. And today is particularly important. So, yes. Yeah, so today we're, we're stressing that we, we, we so far funded about 135 visits, about 80 of them, 80, 90 have been completed. And uh, the, today is the opening for the next call. So we expect to approve in the order of 60, 70 uh, new visits, which people can go, which will be fu fully funded to all the places around Europe. That's fantastic. And the example you see behind me at the moment, this is uh, one of the uh, simulation chambers. This is the, uh, we call it the dusty wind tunnel. And th th that tells you all you need to know about it. Normally, when you're dealing with vacuum systems and trying to mimic the uh, atmosphere of another planet, main maintaining a good vacuum is important. And the last thing you want is dust because that will stop all of the, the seals remaining shut. But in Aarhus, they've managed to set up a system where they can actually have, this is, you can walk inside this. This chamber is so big that a person can actually get inside there. Dust can be blown around. You can simulate uh, dust devils on Mars, for example. Uh, people can get in there and physically set up experiments or put your material, your, your rover or something under Martian yeah. conditions, blow dust at it, see how it survives. Yeah. And you can also see in this picture, you can also irradiate it with different forms of light. So you could potentially see how microorganisms survive under Martian conditions, under certain forms of radiation. So, and I think we have another one underneath. And this is the sort of more analytical side of things. Uh, this is at the Natural History Museum. Well, this, this image is from the Natural History Museum in London where they have a large series of uh, analytical facilities, some of which overlap with what Keywork will tell us about in a minute. But here we're looking at, uh, uh, I think this is a secondary electron microscope image where you're using, full, well, this is basically producing false colors to actually tell us the compositions of minerals inside a piece of a meteorite. And uh, the sort of thing people will be looking at is, you can see some of these mineral grains here are actually zoned in composition. This would mean their iron content or magnesium content is varying from core to rim. And that will tell people who study minerals how they formed, under what conditions, how those conditions changed during the time that the, their grains were forming, and then subsequently were put together to form the meteorite, which we then think smashed to a more meteorites and ultimately produced the planets. Oh. Beautiful. It's such a beautiful image, though, as yeah, well, right? It's a gorgeous. Image, yes. Gorgeous. Wow, that's fantastic. 
Okay, so um, we want to talk now about your your work with with Kiwok, of course, and and your joint um, activities. Yeah. So I will I will pass to Kiwok now. So we Kiwok joined at the beginning yeah. or in year two of the current research infrastructure, and uh, he's managed to get funding from Korea to allow Europeans to visit uh, Korea, and we have a reciprocal agreement so that Koreans can come and visit uh, Europe also for free. And you're saying that he's added 13 laboratories yeah. to your existing 24. That's correct. That's fantastic. So Kiwok, tell us a little bit more. You take the clicker now mm -hmm. and um, and you tell us a little bit more about um, what you've been involved in. Oh, oh yeah, he's one more. Gareth, there's one more slide. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot one. Okay. <laughs> Very important. There's two more. There's actually another one as well, Gareth. Yeah. So there's so. <laughs> two more. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> one of the other things that we, we do within the, the Europlanet is that we actually improve, we try and improve things. And we recognize at the beginning of this uh, Europlanet system uh, cycle that icy planets were a really important part of the future research related to JUICE mission. So we invested quite a lot of uh, effort finding ice simulating facilities. And both the Aarhus uh, uh, facility that we saw before and this facility here at, at Tomki in, uh, in Hungary have developed specific new capabilities to be able to produce and study ice under various different conditions. So here at Atomki, they built this, uh, oh, they built this yep. vacuum, this vacuum chamber, yeah. which can basically simulate almost zero vacuum conditions, not quite, but very close. And that then has through all these uh, opening all the ports you see, they can actually put in high energy radiation and irradiate the ice under different conditions and then simulate what would happen to ice around Jupiter moons as the magnetic radiation from, uh, from, from, from the planet actually interact with the icy moons and try and understand what reactions are going on, how the ice may change over time, and also importantly, how when we detect the ice from, from a passing uh, satellite, how we would interpret that data because clearly we can do measurements from satellites but often we need to mimic the conditions actually out in space to interpret the spectral data that comes along oh, so this 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 line here that we see actually yeah. was commissioned last week so we uh, invested a couple of hundred thousand euros in developing new capabilities in in Atomki, and this is the final output from that so as of as of now people can use it and so in the new call there's a capability to go and use this chamber fantastic and then in and then it's sort of if you like the other end of the spectrum which is more back to the search for life we have a facility in Graz in their micro micro mo, microbial my, microbial life oh I don't know <laughs> I can't speak this morning but in this group in in Graz they are specialists in detecting different forms of life so they do the sequencing and they can they can see all the different forms of life and uh, that facility is very popular and well used and people can either visit or we did it during lockdown, we did even in fact send a few samples virtually that were then analyzed in Graz, which would tell you what sort of microbiological Biological. community yeah. that yeah. you have in your samples. Maybe you've collected in one of the field sites or you've done your own field work somewhere else. That's fantastic. Gosh, these are great. It's really great. Okay. Apolog apologies for forgetting what slides I was given. No, it's okay. So, there so this go. one, this is a joint uh, slide, really, isn't it? So, right. so what are we looking at here, Kiwok? Uh, it was the last year, the September, when we tried to do remote analysis from Amsterdam That's in fantastic. Korea. Uh, it was eight in the morning in Amsterdam, and then four in the four uh, the four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, but uh, she she is a Denise, the student of Gares, and then. This time, the specimen is a small minerals from Botswana in Africa. And then she did preparation in Amsterdam and then yeah. sent, sent the specimen to Korea. And we tried to de age dating uranium red, uh, the, using the uranium red, the half life decay constant. Then the result was 2.7 billion years old. Uh, the numbers that what we, 
2.77 plus minus. Wow, 2.77 billion years old. Yes. Wow. So the uh, we we connected using Zoom and then also remote analysis software. So Denise can um, Denise was able to di directly move the stage and then start the analysis and directly see the result in real time. That's fantastic. So we, wow. We tried it five times from last September to uh, February of this year. So our project was done for several several months, but it was really nice. I That's a fantastic really enjoyed collaboration. It. Yeah. Okay, so you've got more slides. Tell us yeah. more. The, <laughs> Uh, that was the also, but uh, because of uh, the COVID situation, is yeah. uh, got better. So uh, three months ago, Barbara and Kiron uh, had another another uh, application, and then to visit our lab. And so Barbara took my picture, and this is my uh, uh, the, my instrument instrument. Uh, at the also same time, we try to the. Um, uh, one another project using the nano sims and then high high resolution TEM machine to look at uh, very tiny uh, microorganism, which is or uh, three point three billion years old. So that was what we tried to do with Barbara and Kiron, and then they visited here, and then also they uh, they they went to the Busan uh, the nano sims. Uh, spectrometer, the Dr. Taehun, who is in this room, <laughs> he cares. Waving, uh, waving. He, he, ca he cares that this much instrument. This, this is his baby. Uh, yeah, and then at the same time, the the left one is the uh, the flyer by in Korea to promote the Euro Planet um, Research Infra 2024 to the Korean scientists. So oh, I, I distributed this the flyer to the all the members of geological science and astronomical science in Korea. Very good. And yeah. what's with the cakes? You'll have to explain this. That is the. This is actually my uh, <laughs> question. <laughs> the Barbara uh, sent uh, the, uh, the in the week, weekends. Barbara spent some time in very nice the beach in the Haeundae place, and yeah. then she she took the, these pictures, and then it's all the. Uh, the Korean culture, very uh, the nice cake, but even I didn't try yet. So <laughs> I really want to try this one yeah, when I go back I'd to Korea. I'd love to try the panda. The panda one looks lovely. Yeah. And and forty one thousand is that expensive? It looks expensive. That was about the thirty euro. Thirty euro for yes. a cake? Yes, that's expensive. Yeah. Oh please, yeah, we'll share. Are please, they big cakes? Yeah, they don't please, look please big. Korea and I will serve this cake to all yeah. of you. Yes. Okay. If we come to Korea, you're going to get us one of these sure. cakes. I'm in. I'm in. Kiwok. I'm in. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. And and thank you so much for for adding you know uh, an extra thirteen laboratories to the twenty four. So that's nearly fifty percent addition to i mean it's a fantastic opportunity and as you say there's funding available for people to come it's i mean it's a no-brainer really fantastic thank you very much Kiwak. so now let's talk to fernando you're going to tell us a little bit about the field sites part yes. of the transnational access yeah. so so tell us firstly tell us about the the, the field sites and and in general mm -hmm. and your experience of it and 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 some of the slides that you have to yeah, talk actually, about the idea of having uh, field sites that are good analogs for planetary environments is because uh, you can go there and you can test in instrumentation, you can develop new instruments that are going to be used in future missions. Uh, so in this particular case, you can see some people that are studying, for example, that dust devil formation. So yeah. they, they can understand better sedimentary processes related to that. Uh, and then, for example, they can simulate that in the chambers that guard show. Gotcha. And then okay. you can extract environmental information from that those of observ observations. Uh, in particular, I in charge of uh, the sites in Argentina that we can see here oh, wow. and basically there what we do is to this is a lake a high altitude lake in northwestern Argentina where you have really extreme environmental conditions that can be compared at some point with Mars so we take people there to study for example the microbial communities that live there what they are doing and basically what they record what's the record that they leave in the rocks for example there you see some carbonate rocks and those rocks preserve the signatures of that microbial activity, activity. So people can go there and study those, what we call biosignatures and try to see how 
that life, microbial life activity is recorded and that information is really important for the missions that people are doing, for example, in Mars right yeah. now. And what is it about that particular area that makes it such a good kind of um, analog for yeah. Mars? Uh, actually, uh, because it's a high altitude lake, lakes in, the, in this area usually are at 4,000, 5,000 meters above sea level. Uh, the, uh, it's a really dry atmosphere there. You have high UV radiation, extreme winds, extreme temperature changes. Uh, daily changes can be like 40 degrees, for example. So that, those uh, environmental conditions are uh, what we suppose we had, for example, in early Mars history. Okay, okay? Yeah, so yeah. the sedimentary record we see here uh, can be similar, or we are looking for that, for yeah. example, in Mars. And how many uh, do you get? Many people to come and uh, you know to take make use of your yeah, field yeah. Sites? We, we got a really nice, uh, successful field trip with people from Open University and people from Padua University. Uh, that happened uh, in the middle of the year, and we are going to visit the place in December. Uh, so yeah, we are really excited about that. Also, we have sites in Patagonia, for example, where people go to study glacial features and, and glacier dynamics. Uh, also, because uh, the environmental conditions can be compared mm -hmm. at some point with Mars. Yeah. So we are really looking forward for those trips to happen. And, and do you do a field trip once a year, a couple of times well, a year? Most, I would say like twice a year minimum. Oh, okay. And usually each field trip, uh, we take their two groups two different groups so it's pretty interesting and pretty interdisciplinary so yeah. we really enjoy doing that thank you thank you very much Fernando. i'll just come back thank to you, you guard so then how do you select the people for the field trips and how do you select people for okay. the use of the instruments so the, i think the important thing to say is that i have no control oh yes you do I know. <laughs> <laughs> no i don't uh, in that this is all done by a peer review, a blind peer review process. Okay. So something, uh, uh, there's a couple of things I need to stress if you're going to apply. The application has to be anonymous. So we don't want to know who you are. So that it, that is to try and make sure that boring old successful professors like me don't get all the money. And we're really encouraging the younger stuff. That's really people. fair. Yeah. So it's, it's day, purely on the science. There's a peer review committee that is established by the European Science Foundation. They will operate totally independent of Europlanet. They then rank the proposals, and the only decision that Europlanet makes is really how many we can afford to fund. So we have a ranking from 1 to 70. If we say, for example, we're going to fund 50, then the top 50 are funded and the bottom 30, 40 are, are rejected. The success rate is typically just above 50%. So in terms of most funding organizations, that's, pretty that's good. outstandingly that good. That really is. More importantly still, you only need to do one page application. Oh, so yeah. it's not a huge proposal. You have to, but before you do anything, I, I highly recommend that people contact the host. But clearly, arranging to go to uh, Argentina is not a trivial thing, and you need to discuss with the host when is it viable, how long can you go, what is, what, what is viable within a week or, or two in the field. Equally, if you want to work with Kiwok in, in Korea, he needs to know what you want to do, is it, is it possible, and how long you need, and so that you can plan the proposal before you submit it. Once that's done, none of us have any input. So the proposal goes in and it's ind independently reviewed by experts from around the world, mostly in Europe, but there are some international people on the panel. And uh, ESF, depending on how many proposals and how broad they are, will put a couple of panels together of eight, eight, or eight to 10 people and they'll work independently. They come up with scores and that's then... Uh, simply add it up and say okay this is top this is this is bottom and we draw a line somewhere depending on how much funds we have that's great and how long does that whole process take then that's also remarkably quick so we're putting in the the the, the close the call closes in i think 20th of october yeah and we don't guarantee but we're expecting results before christmas and the absolute latest will be january and we have to do it that quick because if people want to go to Greenland or Argentina, there's only certain times of the year when it's practical to do that. Yeah. So we have to plan things well in advance. So going to Iceland, if you want to go to the uh, ice shelf there, uh, the, the ice sheets there, or going to Greenland to that sort of area, you can only go in the summer. So they need to start planning 
in January for people to go in May, June, July, that sort of time scale. Asking for a friend. Um, outreach, are there, uh, is it, is, does it always have to be pure science or uh, outreach? So, so this is Just clearly asking. not from a friend. This is clearly <laughs> a vested interest here, which I do. We do. I mean, yes, in principle, I should I should stress we don't just fund planetary science. The the commission said the European Commission says that if the science is good, it it has to be funded. Uh, I'll use an example. Once one group came to my lab probably ten years ago to study ivory from Africa, and they assumed it was from African elephants, and it was used it to make cutlery uh, for yeah. knives and forks and things. Yeah. And it was from, basically, it was archaeology from 13th, 13, 14th century. And we then could actually say, yes, these, these bits of ivory come from Africa. And in fact, they come from West Africa, not from East Africa. And that's the sort of information they wanted to know. Now, that proposal went through the peer review and the committee said, you yeah, know, this is in new and innovative. And you, we understand why you want to use the facilities in Amsterdam. It's it's an analytical tool that not everybody has. So in that case, archaeologists came funded on planetary science funding, but that's that's happening. And there's no reason why people can't do technical people could technical staff could apply and come and do how do I improve my technical aspects of my laboratory somewhere yeah. else? Or outreach is definitely possible. Actually trying to educate people about planetary science is one of our goals so yeah. if somebody puts in a good proposal to go to argentina or go to uh, botswana, um, botswana. Uh, not just for a holiday <laughs> need, but actually to do some real outreach then then that would that would That's certainly great. be possible but it would be peer-reviewed and you'd have to have a clear goal and aim yeah. of what you wanted to do that's fantastic i mean that's a great 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 opportunity um thank you very much that's that's brilliant um uh lena gareth kiwak and uh fernando i wonder is our keynote here is our keynote here this morning toru uh yes, yes, he's over here. yes toru would you come up please and, and i'd like to speak with you for a few minutes thank you so much very best of luck with the with the call and lena we'll see you around we can ask her anything and she's she's going to answer <laughs> and i'll probably see you tomorrow for something else and thanks so much and best of luck with a fantastic um opportunity that is the the um the the trans nation access so thanks guys thanks very much thank you, very much. Thank you. oh nice round of applause lovely so we have a few minutes left and we have a, an opportunity to speak. Good morning, uh, Toro. Do you want to take this microphone here? Um, I think we have one slide for you. Yes. So you're going to speak with us shortly. I have uh, only a minute or two to mm -hmm. speak with you, but um, can you just give us a little teaser of what your keynote is going to be about at nine o'clock? And it's well worth staying here for. Yeah. Um, uh, today I'm going to talk about the oral series of the Initial uh, uh, description and curatorial work processes for returned Ryugu sample, as you know, uh, near a C type asteroid. And uh, briefly mentioned, also briefly mentioned about the result of the preliminary analytical result. That's fantastic. So you're from Jackson. Were you directly involved in the analysis of the samples from the Ryugu yeah, yeah, yeah. asteroid? Uh, actually, I handled with these small grains. <laughs> that was so fantastic. Oh my gosh. So you got to work with the grains that were on the asteroid Ryugu, which was so far away. That was collected by the Hayabasu, yes. the Haya, Hayabusa, too. Hayabusa too. Yes. Wow. How does that feel to be uh, a part of that kind, that kind of research? Yeah, it's very proud of me. As, and so it's a very honor to be there uh, in that the first uh, sample from the C-type asteroid. It's very exciting period. Uh, I, I and my coworker experienced. I, I yeah. that's fabulous. That's yeah, just it's, fabulous. I'm looking forward to your to your keynote very much, and and wish you every success uh, with your fascinating research. So. Um,
I'm going to uh, let um, uh, Thoreau get ready for his talk. And the only thing left, left to say is, let me just move on, is if you want to get involved in the conversation online, we have a whole comms team here at EPSC that are keeping everybody up to date. That's you guys at home. Um, all you got to do is on Twitter, follow us on at Europlanet Media, on Instagram at Europlanet Media. And also we have a Facebook page as well. And the hashtag is EPSC2022. So uh, good morning, all of you online. I hope you have a good day. Come back tomorrow at 8.30 here at European time. And for the rest of us, let's have a super day too at the EPSC Congress.